I mentioned synchronization on why you should use Java, but again, in standard Java, you have the problem that synchronization results in what's called priority inversion. A priority inversion is a situation in which a high priority thread is waiting for a low priority thread to run. And if that happens in the wrong way, and it does happen that way quite frequently, especially in standard Java, then you're going to end up with very, very difficult to predict systems. Uh, so that's an issue you have to deal with if you're going to do real time. Uh, event processing. Uh, Java has mechanisms for dealing with events, but there is no predictable way to do it and no way to control the scheduling of those events. Uh, in addition, in, in standard Java, there is no way for one thread to cause another thread to asynchronously change its behavior. Uh, there was something called st a stop operation. It was, it's been uh, deprecated years ago because people realized that it was a very dangerous mechanism in Java. Uh, so uh, adding a, a different mechanism became somewhat important. All of this to, to lead to the fact that we have the real-time specification for Java. And the real-time specification for Java allows us to deal with exactly that set of issues. Uh, the RTSJ was created uh, to, to address these problems under the Java community process. Uh, as David mentioned earlier, that's, it was JSR1, uh, or as we put it more formally, JSR00001. Uh, I think people thought there were going to be lots of JSRs, and, and there are. Uh, I should mention, by the way, a small uh, plug for myself is that, that I happen to be the head of JSR 302, which gives you an idea how many JSRs there have been. That JSR was just created uh, last fall, or excuse me, last spring, a year ago last spring, and that's to do safety critical Java. So if any of you are interested in the safety critical community, you may be interested to know that, that people are actually working on a safety critical version of the RTSJ. That is, it'll be a subset of the RTSJ that we're talking about here that will be addressing the safety critical environments. Uh, the expert group for JSR1 was created by Greg Bolella, and you're going to see Greg in a few minutes because he follows me in this uh, uh, platform here. Uh, Greg uh, started the RTSJ, uh, created the expert group, and uh, has set up the, the whole process of making the, getting the thing moving. Uh, it happens that TimeSys Corporation, and it happens that I was with TimeSys Corporation at that time, uh, so uh, Greg and I worked together a bit on this as, as well as some folks from IBM. Uh, took over the, the management of the RTSJ uh, for various political reasons, and it worked out reasonably well. And in fact, TimeSys still is the owner of the, the, uh, of the JSR1 and, and the new JSR282, which is upgrading the RTSJ. It's, it's started adding some new capabilities that will be available over the next uh, year or two. Uh, the specification, the, the reference implementation, and the technology compatibility kit are all available today. And if you don't already know about www.rtsj.org, uh, you should. That's a place you can get the specification. Uh, you can go look at it anytime you wish. Uh, you can actually download the reference implementation uh, for free uh, and run it. Uh, I believe it runs under Linux, and that's available today. Uh, the current version of the specification, it's undergone a couple of minor updates. Uh, the current one is the 1.0.2, and that's the one I'll be talking about today. And I mentioned already, JSR 282 is currently uh, doing some additional follow-on work. Uh, one of the things you learn in the standards community, and I've been involved in many standards. Uh, I was one of the authors of POSIX, for example. But one of the things you learn in the standards community is that the only standards that are not currently being updated are the useless ones. Uh, so when you st see a standard being updated, you know that people are actually beginning to use it, or, or in fact, are probably using it extensively. <coughs> So one of the, this was just one of the issues that led us to, to deal with Java, but I wanted to highlight it. Uh, and that is the fact that we're dealing with uh, a thread that's running. This is on the top line, a standard Java, a thread that may be running. And for some reason, there needs to be running garbage collection. That would happen if, there's, uh, if, if the system believes, if the Java virtual machine believes, there is insufficient memory for it to continue without uh, freeing up some object space. And so the, the garbage collector runs. Now, how long it runs for, and when it runs is not defined by the language, of course. It's defined by the implementation. So the type of garbage collector you use is determined by what the, the vendor supplies to you. And there, there are various choices of garbage collectors. Some run for longer times than others, and some are more predictable than others. The garbage collector I'm showing here is somewhat unpredictable. It just starts running. And some critical event, that, that little star on the top there, uh, occurs. 
Well, when that critical event occurs, I'd like to be able to handle that in a bounded amount of time. That's what it means to be real time, is that I want to be able to handle it within a bounded amount of time. I don't want to have it just go on you know, for some unlimited amount of time. In this case, though, I don't get that kind of control in standard Java, and that's one, been one of the problems with Java. Finally, when a garbage collector is done, I can run my critical thread. One of the things we did in the re real-time specification for Java is we dealt specifically with that issue, making it possible for some threads under very special controls to be able to preempt the garbage collector and run on behalf of some critical event, even if the garbage collector is continuing to run for, for the rest of the system. So let me just talk a bit about the real-time specification for Java. In case you're curious, I have four charts, so that's why they're labeled one on this one, and there'll be three more to follow. What we did in the RTSJ was we made sure that the, that the specification did not violate any principles of the Java language. In fact, it made no changes to the Java language at all. So the real-time specification for Java does not involve any changes to Java. It only means that we've added additional classes and additional methods that make it possible to control the behavior of the Java virtual machine. So everything I'm talking about is simply mechanisms by which you can control how the Java virtual machine is going to respond to the things that are happening in your system. So the first one I'm mentioning is a memory allocation. And mem memory allocation, of course, in Java has always been a heap. The idea was that when you did a new of some object, you would create that object in the heap. Uh, of course, you didn't have to know about the heap. The heap was just there. You created the memory, created the object in the heap, the object would live until no more references for it were found, and then it would be eligible to be garbage collected. Uh, the heap memory is still there. The RTSJ doesn't modify the heap. But it adds two other memory areas that you can allocate objects in instead of the heap. One of them is called immortal memory. Uh, a little bit of a misnomer because uh, it doesn't live forever. It lives as long as the application lives, but not forever. But uh, it's Im immortal memory says I can allocate things there, but they don't get garbage collected. Uh, and as a result, you can run out of space in immortal memory if you're not careful, but it allows you to have a place you can put things that are not going to worry, not going to have to worry about garbage collection. The second thing here is scoped memory. The scoped memory is an area you can create dynamically, an area of memory you can create dynamically and allocate objects in. And under, under particular controls, you can make sure that all of those objects as a group go away. That is, the entire scope memory will be emptied under certain conditions. We won't get into all the details about how that happens here, but it happens all at once without having to do garbage collection. And so you can have temporary things that get, get allocated and make sure you have mechanisms by which they go away later so you don't end up running out of memory. It's having, having used these two, if you have objects that are only working, if you have threads, I should say, that are only working in immortal memory and scope memory, as you can see, and not in the heap, then you don't have to worry about garbage collection. So this is a way by which you can take some parts of your application and run them entirely without having to worry about a garbage collection. And that's why it can safely preempt the garbage collector. I uh, have about a three hour lecture I do on that, by the way, so I obviously am shortcutting a lot of the details, but you can get the details by reading the uh, specification or by chatting with me or Greg or any of the other people out here that are, are familiar with this thing. The second thing we looked at besides memory, and this is tied directly to memory, but it's also very separate from memory as far as the issues to deal with. The second thing we dealt with is the issue of threads. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Java has threads in it. It's always had threads in it. 